This is Health Call Online, the place where you come for extended versions of interviews heard in our weekly syndicated radio broadcast, the Health Call Radio Hour, heard on stations now across the country. Well, you know, the drugs that can successfully treat Alzheimer's have been a major challenge for medicine for decades, but now there is a new group of drugs that appear to be a step in the right direction. The FDA says they do measure up. If someone you know is already impaired with Alzheimer's, sadly, these drugs are not for them. These medications are only for people in the earliest stages of Alzheimer's because they don't block pro progression of this neuro decline. They simply slow it down. So all that neuro issues that we all face so much that still could be out there in the future, even with the help of these drugs. But let's learn more about why one physician says they are going to pose a significant risk to our healthcare system. We're just not ready to handle the stress. Let's meet Dr. Mia Yang. She is a board certified internist and geriatrician at Atrium Health Wake Forest Baptist. She's also principal investigator for several NIH funded clinical trials within the Alzheimer's Research Center. She's a frequent presenter at international and national conferences on this topic. She's also the host of her own podcast, Ask Dr. Mia. So doctor, glad to have you here today. Thank you so much, Lee. It's an honor. Want to first uh, start kind of a big picture and then we'll drill down on some of the tighter issues. Tick off a list of why you say you're concerned about the stress that these new medications could put on our healthcare system. Well, I know the healthcare systems around the country have just been through the pandemic and that primary care in particular has been really hard hit. So people are already stressed, demoralized, short-staffed, and I worry that with the approval of the new monoclonal antibodies against amyloid, it can bring on additional uh, challenges that the healthcare system has to work through. Specifically, all of these monoclonal antibodies come in the form of infusions, mm -hmm. and in the clinical trials where they were done, there were very strict inclusion and exclusion criteria done at specialized centers, including ours, where we carefully screened participants who might be the most eligible for the studies. There has been obviously a lot of infrastructure in place uh, from the pharmaceutical companies to make sure that there's sufficient staff and technology in terms of amyloid PET scans to ensure that people are actually have amyloid in their brain to receive an anti-amyloid drug. However, on the clinical side, where as a researcher and a clinician, I wear both hats. On the clinical side, we really don't have as much of the back office type of support in terms of filtering through people who may have a number of other concerns that may mimic memory loss and try to find the people in that small group of the population who not only have very mild memory problems, but also that their memory problems are most likely due to the earliest signs of Alzheimer's disease with the amyloid in their brain. One of the other issues that I'm hopeful that FDA and CMS will decide to do is to give us a hint as to what sort of biomarker for amyloid that they think would be the most appropriate to use in a larger scale because amyloid PET scans are currently not covered by Medicare or any other insurance companies and they are just astronomically expensive to pay out of pocket for. And, and that's what the studies ended up using to identify folks with amyloid. So we need something alternative to that. Man, there is a lot to unpack there. So for all of us who aren't physicians, clinicians, and, and into the medical terminology, let's back up a second. So these new drugs, as you said, are monoclonal antibodies. And to make it simple, kind of a real easy explanation, um, antibodies are proteins that our bodies attach to things that it thinks are bad to call our immune system to go fight them. And in Alzheimer's, we think those are these amyloids that you mentioned, a plaque deposit that gets established in our brains. So that's kind of how these drugs work, right? They call our immune system to attack what it thinks is going wrong. That's correct. It is attacking the amyloid protein and different drugs attack different formulations of the protein in our brain. And 
Uh, there are a number of other potential causes of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so amyloid is most likely not the only cause, but it is what we are specifically talking about for this class of medication. So these drugs do come with some risks, and you identified some of them there. We have to very carefully identify patients for whom are likely to receive benefit. And you said that that right now involves a PET scan. How expensive is a PET scan? Uh, it, can, it can range from a couple thousand dollars to tens of thousands of dollars. Really just depends on where people get them from. It's not as common as a CT scan where any sort of emergency services probably has a CT scan. It's much more specialized. Uh, it's using nuclear medicine that tag those amyloid proteins to be able to see it on the brain. Um, so similar to PET scans that cancer patients may have gotten in their cancer workup looking for parts of their body that have signals of cancer, this basically tags something similar using the same technology. Okay, so that's one problem. This diagnostic to even get into the program and receive these medications is crazy expensive and just not available in a lot of communities. Okay, so there's problem one. Then there's the issue of what happens when your immune system starts going to war with something in your brain. So tell us about that. Yeah, so this is where we know through the clinical trials that there are some rare but definitely possible side effects that are called amyloid-related imaging abnormalities, or ARIA, A-R-I-A-S. Um, it's kind of a nondescript name, um, but really it's talking about small areas of swelling and small areas of bleeding in the brain. And because it's generating an inflammatory response against these protein, the brain is basically in the process of removing them. So part of monitoring for ARIA is by doing serial MRIs of the brain to pick, be able to pick up these very small areas of swelling and, and or microbleeds or small bleeding and appropriately stop the medications if they get to a certain threshold, such as, you know, either the patient is having symptoms or that they're big enough that we need to pause or potentially stop the medication altogether. So I'm going to go have these medications through an infusion, an IV. How often are they administered? So for the lecanemab specific uh, drug that uh, is pending FDA approval, it is every two weeks, which it's very frequent, uh, much more frequent than even some of the chemotherapies that we think of for cancer. So I've got to go have this infusion every two weeks. How often then do I need to have the MRI checkup to make sure there's not something going wrong on my brain? So that is... Again, we're waiting for FDA official approval and the package insert in terms of indicating how frequently. We do have an idea with aducanumab, which is a similar drug that had a, a whole ton of its own controversy when it was approved, I think, in 2021. But um, we know that for the MRIs, they probably have to be done at least two or three times during the first year of getting the infusion. Great. So there's the MRI expense and, and all of that issue on top of it. So what's the expectation? What did the uh, trial show us in terms of outcomes? How much does this really slow progression of the disease? Yeah, so this is an area of active debate. And the trials were done uh, over a course of 18 months. And these are in people who have very mild symptoms. So they compare folks who are getting a placebo uh, saline infusion versus the lecanemab infusion. Uh, the companies that run the trial looked at a number of different outcomes, but the primary outcome they were looking at is sort of a composite memory test. And that in people who um, have received the lecanemab, there are a small, a small degree of less decline compared to the folks who received the placebo. So this is in uh, a, a 
test called the Clinical Dis uh, Dementia Rating Scale, and it's out of 18 points, and the difference was probably about 0 0.5. But again, it's, the, it's not a very remarkable difference. However, the other side would say that most of the participants within the trial never got to 18, because 18 is the maximum amount of dementia severity. Most people were in that sum of boxes range of three to five. So if there was a 0 0.5 difference out of, say, three or five, that may be significant. And there's also um, a potential extrapolation of what does this 18 months improvement mean down the line? If people mm -hmm. are getting improvement in the very early stages, could that be compounded as time goes on to be uh, more improvement or less decline compared to the folks who got nothing five, ten years down the line. That's where we really don't have enough data to really say exactly what that might be. Um, the reason why lecanemab is particularly uh, has less controversy compared to aducanemab is that all of the secondary outcomes, including some outcomes on how people function in daily life, is also showing improvement. So all of the data is at least consistent, but it's a small difference, and it just depends on kind of different clinician and researchers interpretation of how much that difference could realistically be. But I don't think any one of us have, you know, a crystal ball as to say, you know, if you take this medicine for 18 months, you'll gain an X amount of time down the line. So with all of that fuzziness out there, um, <laughs> the cost is going to be phenomenal. So the cost of the medications themselves is not set, but I've seen like $60,000 a year. Is that kind of on target? Is that where we think this is going to come in? I think that was the original price for aducanumab, $56,000. Mm -hmm. um, and then lecanumab, I think, was set or predicted to be set around twenty-six, twenty-eight thousand dollars $28,000 per year. So that is not including the cost of the MRIs, the infusion yeah. center, the clinicians, um, all of the other monitoring that goes around it. There has been some estimation on the part of folks who are um, in health economics as to how much this would cost Medicare mm -hmm. over a, you know what predicted amount of uh, potentially eligible patients who might be receiving it, and it probably is going to be around a billion dollars or more or less, depending on, in actuality, how many people end up taking it. Do we have any idea what percentage of patients are going to be eligible and qualify? So that has also varied, and that really will depend on how strict FDA sets kind of the inclusion criteria or the eligibility criteria and what population of patients we're looking at. There has been uh, a number of different studies that have looked at, you know, out of the clinical population of folks who say come to see me in a memory clinic or a large population of people that you're following over time, it really has ranged from, say, less than 1% of people in an Italian memory clinic to something like 12% out of a, a different pool of patients. But it's definitely not the majority of patients who have Alzheimer's disease. So is there, I, one of the challenges here is finding those people with early symptoms. We don't really have a good way of screening those folks out, right? I mean, I, I could be in my 50s still working and experiencing some challenges that I would never associate with early onset of dementia, right? That is what's tricky is that the more highly educated you are, the more uh, cognitively challenging your job is, the more subtle the differences you might be noticing. And this is the whole field of what's called neuropsychology, where they try to compare people's cognitive functioning with what we think are the norms of a certain age or a certain population um, or a certain degree of education. But we don't always get that comparison. In fact, most of the time, we're not comparing 
you're testing with yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't know how you were when you were 50 versus, say, 55 or 60. So the norms are there. That introduces another point of uncertainty. You know, if you're a, um, you know, someone who's very highly educated, did a very cognitive intense job, you may not be able to do that job, but you still will be very functional in your daily life because what you need to do in your daily life is not as cognitively challenging. So it usually takes quite a lot of testing to be able to tease out what is considered mild cognitive impairment, which means this is not just normal changes with aging versus is um, abnormal changes with aging, but not dementia. And the difference between mild cognitive impairment and dementia is really how people are functioning in their normal life. And that's highly variable depending on what degree of cognitive load or cognitive uh, stimulation you have in your daily life. Someone who might be sitting around watching TV all day, th there's not a whole lot of mm -hmm. stimulation or or risks that they have to, to do and may not notice much changes over a long period of time. You know, I want to be excited about these drugs. I want to be excited about this progress. But after everything we've discussed, I'm just not there yet. This this feels like I hate to use this phrase, but it feels like something of a big what a nothing burger. You know, I mean, it's is it really that big a deal? I think it is a big deal in the sense that these are the first what we think are disease modifying drugs. So with the Nepazil or Aricept, Namenda or Memantine, mm -hmm. all of those are very symptomatic treatment. They're not specifically targeting the underlying disease. I tell my patients they keep molecules that we all have around our brain around longer for memory and attention. They're not miracle pills. Um, but there may be some small improvement in a subgroup of people. Uh, the reason why there is so much excitement around the MABs or the monoclonal antibodies is that these are the first drugs that we think are targeting the underlying disease. And so even though the group of folks in the clinical trials who received lecanemab or aducanemab um, did not necessarily have improvement of their memory compared to placebo. It is definitely showing a slowing of disease compared to those who received placebo. So I would say I'm, I'm a little excited. I'm not the most excited, but I'm a little excited. <laughs> Okay. So a small smiley face emoji. All right. Yes, I get that. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So is the expectation that once I'm starting on these meds, I'm just going to be on them for long term? How often might I have these infusions? So that's another uh, uncertainty. So at least we know with lecanemab that people have been on them for 18 months for the duration of the study and potentially longer after that. Um, there are a, a, there is another drug that is um, coming out in the next couple of months called Donatamab, mm -hmm. which uh, was sort of tested to stop early. So uh, it, they looked at how much amyloid you have in your brain after getting the infusion for a couple months, and if you have great clearing of amyloid in your brain, then they stop the medication. Those results are not fully published yet, so I don't know, but this is what they have shared so far in press release. All of that is to say it probably will depend on the drug specifically and also depending on um, how people are doing in terms of any potential side effects or the burden of getting the drugs. Um, but the big answer is really, we don't know how long people need mm. to be on it. You know, at what point do we say recheck an amyloid pet or some other biomarker for an amyloid and then monitor that over time and potentially resume the drug at a later point? Um, what we do know about amyloid buildup is that typically it's rather slow and it's built up over decades or years. So once that amyloid is cleared out, it's very unlikely to be suddenly back. Um, mm. So all of that is to say we don't know exactly. 
You know, I guess here's I'm I'm feeling like this and you check me on this. Right. So give me a read on whether I'm on the right path here. So if I have a lot of infrastructure limitations, there aren't enough infusion centers, there aren't enough uh, doctors who are skilled in this. There aren't enough effective means to test patients and identify those who are going to be able to be candidates. The cost of all of this is extreme at the minimum, uh, outlandish at the maximum. Um, this really, I see why you're saying we're not ready for this. Uh, I, I got that. So what's your thinking about the average patient? How excited should I be if I think I might be headed down this road? Yeah, I think I have talked about in some of my previous podcast episodes about there's really in my mind two different Alzheimer's disease. There is the the majority of folks with Alzheimer's disease who kind of get it later in life uh, or that they may have had a parent who got it later in life, meaning in their 70s, 80s or beyond. Mm -hmm. I think that's much more of a mixed picture in terms of what's going on in pe people's brain. And it's not just amyloid. We know, in fact, that people can have amyloid in their brain and have normal memory uh, on testing and in function for years. So that's, I think, goes back to why the amyloid hypothesis has been so controversial. But I do think these drugs are particularly exciting, or at least I'm excited for, the folks who are in the early onset Alzheimer's disease group. These are folks who are in their late 50s or mid 50s or early 60s who are noticing changes in terms of their memory at their jobs and they're not may not be even Medicare eligible um, but they're seeing changes and we know that through memory testing they are not normal changes for a 50 to 60 year old and that they're seeing themselves kind of going down this path of decline, uh, oftentimes maybe at a faster pace than someone who is older. I think this is the group of folks that I've had conversations about lecanemab with because almost always these are amyloid-driven diseases and that these drugs could potentially be most helpful uh, and save these folks a longer or delay um, the decline in their function in a very noticeable way because they're young, you know, they have decades potentially mm -hmm. of their life and that if they don't do anything and we think this is definitely early onset Alzheimer's disease, then usually this is the disease that ends their life prematurely. So that's why I do think my my small smile face emoji is really for the groups of patients who are like this, um, who may have a family history and are noticing changes and have gotten testing that shows this is not normal. This is not menopause. This is not anxiety, depression. This is not the medications that they're on. They've ruled out other things that could be in influencing it. So what are those symptoms? What should I be looking for? You got me paranoid now. I mean, it's not, you know, I forgot where I put my car keys. That's not the thing here. What what are those symptoms that we need to be alert to? Yeah, and that can really be quite um, subtle and difficult to tell in, in a person's daily life, meaning, you know, with age, we're always having a little bit more time, uh, needing a little bit more time in terms of multitasking. Um, and I think this is really the difference that's going to be told in in cognitive testing. Because even if I take a very detailed history talking to you for an hour, I may not really know what is normal for your age versus abnormal for your age. And this is where memory testing is really important. Uh, one test that is has been out for decades and is developed specifically to identify folks with mild cognitive impairment is what's called MOCA or the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. Mm -hmm. um, it's a harder test than some of the other common tests called a mini mental status exam. And sometimes uh, if people are having a lot of problems in what we call um, executive functioning, meaning they're having a difficult time sequencing things together, or that they're having just a very isolated problem in terms of their short-term memory and everything else is okay, those are typically the early signs of something that's not normal for their age. 
So I love asking this question to people with your experience and expertise. What is it you do? What are your lifestyle modifications specifically designed to reduce your risk of dementia? Yeah, so great question. I think uh, the same things that I also tell my patients, I try to be physically active. I do aerobic exercise. I enjoy rowing, which is both uh, strength training and aerobic and together. Um, I try to eat a healthy diet. I may not eat the full Mediterranean diet, but try to eat more plant-based um, olive oil, less you know, takeout and fried mm -hmm. foods. Uh, obviously, I'm in a pretty socially and intellectually challenging environment as a result of my work. Um, and that I'm careful in terms of the medications I take and trying to monitor, you know, my own sleep um, over time, I actually have um, very mild sleep apnea. I've tried <laughs> to wear a CPAP. If you look at me, you would never think that I have no. sleep apnea. Uh -uh. Um, but thinner people could have sleep apnea as a result of their um the anatomy of their jaw or, or their palate. And so those are the things that, you know, I, I have sought out medical attention for, and I understand that it is frustrating as a patient, no matter what your background is, to go through the system and try to find the find out what's what could be changed. So those are the things that I would say, you know, I'm actively doing. I also know I have a little bit of hearing loss in one particular ear. It's not very severe, but I know that if it does get worse as I get older, I would be um, absolutely not hesitant and not vain about wearing a hearing aid because those are the things that are going to help me maintain my memory and my balance and um, all the things that I want to do to be able to live a very functional life. Boy, uh, great talking with you. Anything I didn't ask, anything you want to leave us with, wrap this up? Uh, I would just to say that there's also a lot of confusion between what is dementia versus Alzheimer's dementia mm -hmm. and, and Alzheimer's disease. All of those words and uh, are oftentimes used interchangeably. So I just like to clarify, dementia just means that someone has memory loss that is impacting their daily life. And we know it's not because of something that we could modify. And usually they're in the class of neurodegenerative diseases, meaning they, we expect them to get worse over time. But there are many types of dementia. I compared dementia to a big tree and the biggest branch on that tree is Alzheimer's disease. Um, the disease itself can be ongoing, meaning you have amyloid or other abnormalities going on in your brain for years before you actually get to the dementia category. So people could have Alzheimer's disease and have the symptom of mild cognitive impairment, but we think that their underlying mild cognitive impairment is due to Alzheimer's disease, mm -hmm. but they may not have worse, gotten worse to the point that they're not able to do some of the more challenging things in our daily life, like paying our bills, managing our medicines, driving. Um, but there's definitely uh, a difference between the disease, dementia, and Alzheimer's disease or dementia. That's a good place to wrap this up. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. And if you'd like to hear more, you can always look for Dr. Mia's podcast. It is Ask Dr. Mia. You'll find it on all the major services. Thanks so much. Thank you, Lee.